is effectively utilizing the gateway, that is the lunar gateway, to explore the moon and Mars with our moderator, Joe Cassidy of Aerojet Rocketdyne, who we talked to uh, yesterday, or actually this morning during one of these breaks. So uh, Joe, if you're ready, uh, come on out. Thank you. All right. So uh, back from lunch, hope you all had a good lunch and we're ready to uh, continue with some exciting, uh, hopefully exciting news for you about what we're gonna do as we go out further in space and uh, orbit the moon, what we can do with the gateway and how that can help us get ready for Mars. So I'm just gonna introduce the panel members and then I'm gonna let them tell you all the, the really cool stuff that they're working on. So. My friend Maria Antoinetta Perino, she is Director for Exploration and Science Programs at Talos Alenia Space in Torino, Italy. Um, she's involved in all the major activities related to exploration in Europe, including ExoMars, the Mars Sample Return, uh, the Gateway, European Contributions. She's a member of the International, um, I can't read your writing. <laughs> ah, oh, yes, thank you. Inter International Astronautics Academy, and she's the former vice president of the IAF Bureau and president now, since yesterday, since yesterday of Humans to Mars in Europe. So, Maria. <laughs> to her left is Peter McGrath of Boeing. Peter's the director of global sales and marketing for space exploration under the space and launch system within Boeing's defense, space, and security. His prior assignments over his 30 year career there at Boeing include program manager for the Army's Brigade Combat Team Modernization Low Rate Initial Production. Wow, that's a <laughs> mouthful. Senior manager of business development for space situational awareness programs and leadership and engineering positions on Boeing Launch Services Delta IV, DCXA, X33, X34, and the International Space Station. Peter earned an MBA from the University of Southern California, an MS in Aerospace Engineering from Cal State University Long Beach, and a BS in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Southern California. To Peter's left is Mike Fuller. Mike has been with uh, now Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems, I still call them Orbital ATK, but I'm, I'm getting used to Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems, for 14 years, and he's currently working in business development, responsible for NASA programs, Mike's responsibilities include NASA's Space Launch System Booster and other SLS-related activities. Preceding working in business development, Mike spent seven years in R&D working on thermal production and high-rate temperature her ultra-high temperature materials before becoming the thermal protection systems lead for the Ares One first stage. He earned a bachelor's degree in ceramic engineering and a master's degree in material science and engineering from some school in Ohio. Uh, oh, the Ohio State University, <laughs> and has been awarded five patents over his life. <laughs> and then finally, uh, Neeraj Gupta is Director of Programs and Advanced Development at Sierra Nevada Corporation. And there he's responsible for evaluating advanced concepts for emerging space markets. His group is responsible for executing SNC's lunar programs and developing technologies and platforms for the gateway efforts. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Maria, to get us started. You have the clicker? Okay. Yeah, I try. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. I feel really honored eh, to be on this panel today. Uh, my short presentation will be focused on uh, humans. Eh? Uh, we, uh, we spent the last uh, two days uh, sharing uh, what we'll agree is a sort of imperative. We want to explore, we are explorers. And so no matter what uh, um, we plan to do next, uh, we will reach out to Mars. And so uh, uh, both the lunar surface and the gateway in orbit around the moon and the space station in low Earth orbit can in fact contribute to this, I don't want to call it final goal, but to the current destination to be. Uh, the way we plan to do that uh, is uh, a multi-step approach uh, and uh, we will need uh, to develop a lot of enabling technology and the LOB-G uh, facility in fact can be the proper place uh, where we get prepared for uh, more challenging missions. Uh, let me just uh, show you 
some of our sketches, um, we care a lot about, uh, uh, we focus on, on the human being needs. And so uh, our current uh, design uh, are human-centered uh, because we truly believe that we need to offer a more comfortable uh, living environment for the people that will spend longer and longer period of time far away from Earth, from, far away from their families. Uh, we are technical people though, and so we are conscious that uh, we have to fit uh, with the given available uh, transportation means. And so our design solution would fit uh, both, uh, let's say, all the available transportation system, uh, both commercially and uh, co-manifested with the new uh, uh, SLS transportation system. Uh, we, we don't start from scratch. Uh, we have been developing, uh, developed a solid background uh, in finding solution for people living on board the space station. And so starting from there, for sure we cannot plan to offer this type of environment uh, to our astronaut uh, living in um, deep space. Uh, we will need to find a, a new solution for uh, offering them a more flexible environment. Uh, we will need to protect them from uh, a radiation environment that is harsh. Uh, we will need to uh, offer them an environment that they can adjust to their needs. Uh, thanks God we have new technologies that uh, uh, offer us uh, uh, this type of uh, options. Uh, we have uh, uh, the possibility to um, use 3D printing, for example, to uh, provide uh, additional tools on board. As for the radiation protection, uh, we plan to use water. Uh, and so we are building what I like to call water walls inside our uh, modules. You can see here some uh, design. And uh, the basic message that I want to, to leave you, and we might discuss later, eh, if we have time for questions, uh, we need to develop a system where can, people can feel uh, fine, they can feel at home, they can be effective and be able to operate uh, properly. And so uh, before closing, I just like to share with you a short video that summarizes what uh, we are trying to contribute to the LOPG with this new uh, habitat concept. It won't last long, eh? so it will fit in the, in the given time. So maybe the assembly sequence will be revisited after uh, the current uh, uh, needs eh, that oh, were expressed right. by yeah. Riederstein yesterday. Eh? But I just like to come to the interior features. So once we enter, you will see you won't resist. You will need an Italian design <laughs> for people living aloft. Eh? Hopefully a cappuccino maker. Uh, the, we already design it, so ah, we, will, uh, we already have a coffee machine, we can do better. <laughs> uh, so we have coffee and we have water. We can use, yeah, we can use the bottom part of our modules. In this case, it's a rigid module, but our colleagues here on the stage know that we, we master also inflatable technologies. Uh, so the idea is really to, uh, to offer a wider, livable, uh, place. Uh, we, we learned yesterday how critical uh, is uh, to live for a longer period of time in a reduced gravity environment, so we will need to exercise. And when we have finished with the gym, then we will uh, uh, reconfigure the, the internal layout for a crew cabin, for social uh, uh, get-together uh, among the crew. Uh, you just saw the, the, the shield uh, protection. <clears throat> As I said before, using water. Uh, the idea is to, this is the water wall for uh, the very high radiation. And um, 
you see here that we are uh, working with the crew uh, private spaces. Ah, so you have your, your own private space. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the virtual reality, the augmented reality will offer uh, our people the possibility to have a look back home where maybe home is not so close anymore. Okay, this is what I wanted to share with you today. So we, we know how to design and build pressurized uh, elements that can be applied to the Lob G, it could be applied to a lunar lander or to an ascent vehicle or to a pressurized rover. This is what we like to offer, a place where people can live in a comfortable way. Thank okay. you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. <laughs> Let's see, I have, um, I, I literally have three slides. That's all I'm gonna show you today. And, and they're all pictures. So I like to show, typically show pictures. Let's we'll see if the first one comes up here. Do I have to? Yeah. Oh, nope. Yeah, He's way. coming. Uh, okay. Hold for just a second. Mm -hmm. I'll wear yours. Well, here I can talk while they're holding. I guess. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Gateway in general, um, and I'll start with a conversation around because I think at lunch it was said, you know, do we need a gateway? Do we not? Do we not need a gateway? There's a lot of, I guess, conversation around that, but I, I think it's kind of settled around that at least NASA's baseline, and, and I agree with them, is that we kind of need a gateway. And actually, if you think about it and you look back at history, when we did the Apollo program, they actually looked at potentially putting a permanent orbiting presence around the moon, a, a service module that was reusable and stayed in orbit. The reason for that, you know, if you look back at the Apollo program, we primarily were on direct return missions. So the, the, it was set up in a way that when the Apollo capsule went out around the moon, if the service module engine did not fire, it would just come straight back to Earth and you could recover the crew. That was the reason that it was kind of structured that way. And, and when they did it that way, it limited you basically to landing about five degrees off the equator of the moon. So you were pretty limited on what your mission constraints were gonna be if you're gonna do a direct approach. Now, you could argue with different orbits we're playing around with today, maybe you can change some of that a little bit, but, but if you really wanna open up the entire moon you know, access to the entire moon, you, you need something in lunar orbit that gives you that ability to do it. The other thing it gives you is, um, if there was an anomaly, it's a great safe haven for the crew. They don't, if, if there was an Apollo 13 incident, they can rendezvous there and, and, and survive, and they don't have to make their way all the way back to Earth. Or if there was an, an issue on the abort for the lander, they just have to abort back to the gateway. So there's a lot of reasons to have um, a continual orbiting presence around the moon. This, this picture is um, our depiction, you know, matter of fact, most of us on the stage, I know at least two, two of us also have contracts with NASA to go look at Gateway. And this was our architecture that we put in um, as part of our study. The way it's laid out here, this is, I, I won't call this the minimalist because I'll show you a minimalist one in, in a minute, but, but we talk about the power propulsion elements, the first element that everybody talks about, something that provides the power for the, uh, the gateway, it also provides the ability to move the gateway around in orbit or keep it on station if you want. The nice thing about it is you can actually move this pretty easily from uh, the NRHO that it's in, which I, I know we like uh, near rectilinear orbit, but it, it's, which is really simple terms, it's really an elliptical orbit that has its lowest point around the South Pole, which, which allows you to get to the South Pole. And it's about a six day cycle, I think is the orbit cycle we've been talking about. Um, but, but it, with the PPE, you could actually take this and put it, move it all out to L1 if you wanted to. Maybe I want to go you know, work on a telescope at L1, and maybe I want to go to L2. So it allows you to move the gateway around too if you want to in orbit. Uh, the second element we talk about, I think NASA now calls it a utilization element, but it's some type of a, a node or a, a mini node habitat that has at least two axial ports and two radio ports because you want to be able to dock things to it. Um, you see on here, we had a habitat after that. We also had an airlock on here, which is the one that's poking up, and then we had the lander on the bottom. I, we're showing a two-stage lander. I know there's still some discussions about two versus three-stage landers, but the, the one on here is a two-stage lander. But this is kind of what we have been thinking about as a, a minimal approach. The idea is you start with something small, and, and I'll show you a minimal one in a minute, but you start something small, and then you allow it to grow, because as you grow, you add capabilities, so you can stay longer. 
It also gives me a great aggregation point for international partners to come up and add capability and contribution too. Yeah. And, and so it's a great opportunity to really create a global approach to getting back to the moon versus just a domestic US approach. So there's a lot of talk about minimalist gateway because they're saying now that we want to get back to the moon in 24, we need to do something that just puts enough up there to allow us to do it, which basically means I need a power propulsion element and I need that, I call it a habitat with radial ports. I've got to have the ability to transition the crew. And another way to think of it, when you go up, we were talking about the mission, you're going to take four astronauts up on an Orion. Two of them are going to stay at the gateway and two of them are going down to the surface. So you want to provide them at least an environment they could sustain for six days, which is roughly the time they're going to be on the surface. You want to make it a livable space that's at least accommodating for that and maybe an opportunity to do some research and value-added work while they're up there. And so you know, our, our philosophy in these two is, you know, if you're going to do this as cheaply and quickly as possible so you can focus all your efforts on lander, which is really the critical path to getting to the surface, buy as close as you can to an off-the-shelf commercial satellite, which by the way, our company builds probably the most powerful satellite built right now. But, but hey, I know you'll, you'll argue with me on that, but, but, but we, we do actually build commercial satellites. Um, and we have a, a lot in the factory too. So NASA needs to make sure that as they do this though, they're buying one of many, not the only satellite from a company or else you end up paying for all the infrastructure. The, the other part of that is, as you look at habitats, where we've been focusing is um, leveraging space station because We've got 20 years of operational experience. Boeing actually helped design and build the station. And I'll show you a picture of our mock-up that we have right now that is at Marshall. But we've taken the lessons learned from those 20 years of operation and actually created a, a, a living space inside that habitat that's 30% larger than what it is today on station. So we found a way to actually make it more of a, a usable space for astronauts. So with that, um, as part of our package that we did with NASA, as, as are the others here, and they'll show you theirs, I think, their pictures. This is our demonstrator. We have it sitting at Marshall uh, Space Flight Center. It's basically two elements. It's a, it's a habitat with two ports, and it's a, an airlock. And, and in it, you know, we have a crew command deck in it. Um, we actually have robotic systems in it so that it can be autonomously operated from the ground, and you can do experiments and things while you're up there. Um, the interesting thing you see, you have five people standing there in a space that's uh, just that first node on the left, which is about what you need for the first element. And there's five people easily standing in there. So it shows you how much more spacious it is than if you've seen anything up on station today. But uh, you know, really the focus is on trying to get there as quickly as possible with a gateway that will cost NASA the least amount of expenditures with the least amount of schedule risk so that NASA can focus in on doing what they need to get to the surface, which is the lander. So I'll stop there and look forward to questions. Thanks, Peter. So I guess my turn. Um, Peter did a great job of uh, kind of exploring and kind of giving you the, base, the basics of the, uh, uh, as he's calling it, just gateway. I, I have on mine lunar orbital platform gateway, LOPG, however you want to describe it, um, this mini uh, I think Gersh described it as, the, and Bridenstine yesterday described it as uh, the service module around the moon. Um, basically looking at that element that is going to be uh, available for um, aggregation, for joining up with, joining your crew and your mission elements together to do whatever exploration portion you're going to be looking at. Whether that's to the moon or whether that's to Mars, that's uh, uh, up in the air. So, all right. Am I still waiting? Okay, I'll just, I'll keep, I'll talk until, uh, we'll riff on this until we uh, get some charts. Um, but, but basically, uh, what you're gonna hear a lot from me is gonna be <clears throat> very similar to what uh, Peter talked about, is basically trying to utilize uh, existing capabilities that we've already put together to, uh, to make this as quick and as cheap as, well, I shouldn't say cheap, uh, as quick and as inexpensive as possible to, uh, to get the capability we're looking for, both for, 2024, as well as longer term when we're looking uh, for the more sustainable missions later in 2028 uh, and beyond when we, uh, when we go to Mars. So this is kind of the, uh, we've, we've called stepping stones, you've heard proving grounds in the past, uh, but very similarly, this is uh, a modular approach to add capability as you need based on the mission at hand. So what, uh, 
what NASA has kind of looked at for 2024 is, as, as Peter described earlier, the minimalist gateway, uh, power and propulsion element, and some sort of utilization mini hab facility that could be up there to sustain astronauts for some short period of time. Um, and similar to where uh, Boeing looked at using their, their heritage ISS capabilities, uh, we did something similar but using the, um, our Cygnus uh, spacecraft that we currently use for ISS uh, cargo delivery, utilizing that as the baseline, both the pressurized module as well as the service module in the background to get the elements to their uh, final locations. Still not up. Um, and one of the things I want to go into in a little bit more detail on the backside is actually what is it, why are we even looking at this as far as where it is and why is it advantageous to have it located where, uh, where we're currently looking at having it located. This near, the NRHO, near rectilinear, near rectilinear halo orbit, um, as described, is kind of a unique setting point for, uh, for putting this service module in, in orbit around the moon. And uh, for those physicists out there, astrodynamicists, um, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that it's not, a, it's not truly a, a lunar orbit, even though it looks like a lunar orbit, uh, but let's not nitpick it. It's a lunar orbit, it goes around the moon. Um, it is very conveniently located, both as, as was previously stated, to, to go to L1, L2, SEL1, if you wanted to go to Sun Earth, L2, or SEL1, SEL2, all of the Lagrange points in the, in the three body problem are looked at, are basically easily accessible using uh, some sort of a manifold trajectory from the, uh, from the current gateway location to go wherever. Uh, we again talked about L1, L2 uh, in the Sun Moon system, or Earth Moon system, if you wanted to go uh, at some of these larger satellites, James Webb, um, some of the ones at Louvar in the future, uh, anything beyond that HabEx, those types of systems which are going to be located at Sun Earth, L2, may necessarily need to be serviced by some sort of human intervention. So that gives you, provides you either, you take the gateway out and bring this, uh, the telescope back. It gives you uh, some capability to do more than just service the moon. So uh, it is a, uh, a very, I think a useful uh, capability to have. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have Oh, let me just check the status. Are we getting Mike's chart? No, I do not have his presentation. Oh, okay. Then we'll okay. just go. We'll just go. All off right. Of it. That makes it easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I had a pretty pictures of the. Uh, we actually have a uh, a gateway installation that we did under the Next Step Two program at Johnson Space Flight Center uh, that is set up. It, it also has the similar has an, has the uh, the airlock module. Has we actually took it, a, I don't want to say if it's a step further or if we decided to include options, but included both a, uh, a three meter Cygnus derivative uh, as well as a four and a half meter ISS derivative uh, HAB to give, uh, to give NASA a, a feel for what the, what the volume constraints are for the various different sizes. If you really want to go minimalist, a, a three meter uh, pressure vessel would be very relatively easy for us to produce on, a current, on the current production lines that Thales is, uh, uh, very, very handily able to make for us. We appreciate that. Um, and, but if it, that doesn't serve the purpose, then you have the, the capability to go larger and to be, uh, to have more volume available. Uh, now, one of the other uh, parts that I talk about is, or is, was uh, set up was actually looking at that gravity well situation, looking at the why is it at that point. And I kind of, we alluded to it a little bit, but if you look at the way the, the gravity potentials are set, when you're up around L1, L2 in that space, you've basically gotten completely out of the Earth's gravity well. So you don't have to worry about that delta V that's available. You can think of it like a big pit. Um, you're basically up on the rim, being able to look down, but you're also looking down to the moon, so it's relatively easy to go there. It's easy to go to the, go to the Earth. Uh, and it only takes just a little bit of effort to get you going out towards Mars. So it actually makes a very convenient uh, aggregation point for vessels that are going to go to any location within, uh, within the solar system. And so it is, a, uh, I think, a key element of anything we're going to do as far as being sustainable in, the, uh, in our exploration, going to the moon and then going beyond to the solar system, Mars included. So uh, with that, I'll cede the rest of my time and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Absolutely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we have. Oh, okay, good. There we, we go. Nerds just church. Uh, okay. Apparently my church. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Although you don't have you don't have the Lop G set up. I, I don't. I don't have the Lop G yeah. set up. Right. Um, so uh, so at, at Sierra Nevada, you know, we've been working uh, on the Gateway now for for a couple of years. And let me first by, start by saying, no, I'm not going to talk about Dream Chaser going to the moon. It's not. We're not planning to take G Dream Chaser to the moon. We always get that question. Um, so uh, you know, as as uh, uh, over these last couple of years, there's been a lot of um, changes in in uh, uh, the overall architecture, the objective of uh, of Gateway, and you can see them up here, right? We kind of try to take, aggregate them and say, well, what's changed over over the uh, uh, life so far? And uh, you can see, starting on the top left, there's the what's I think affectionately called the squid chart. Uh, that shows the uh, Earth to, to Mars, and uh, you see no moon in the middle of that, right? And so we slowly gravitated to more moon-centric, uh, and now going back to, to Mars, at, you know, the moon to Mars kind of concept here. Um, so the point of that is, you know, what we did at, at Sierra Nevada is looked at, uh, you know, start with the end in mind, right? And know, know everybody's heard, heard that saying before. And really the end here is, is Mars. I think we're all looking to, to get to Mars. Moon is, is a destination in between. Uh, you heard the administrator talk about it yesterday as well as we're going to Moon so that we can go to the Mars. Uh, and so that's, that's really what we're looking for. So if we keep that eye toward going to Mars, we'll, I think, better utilize the Moon and better utilize the system that, that we use in between. Um, I won't go over any of the, the, the details of the, uh, the, the gateway. I think my colleagues did that uh, fantastically here. So, uh, so when, when we started uh, looking at, at the overall gateway concept, um, we took a little bit uh, different approach, right? We had a blank sheet of paper. We started with what we knew, which was you know, Dream Chaser, Chaser Technologies. We've been to every, every uh, planet that uh, NASA or JPL or anybody has gone to. So we've been on all of those missions through various uh, subsystems. Um, but we, we could kind of start with a clean sheet of paper and said, OK, well, how would we take this, uh, this challenge of, of going to the moon and going to Mars? And what, what, do we, what do we really need? So we gave ourselves basically five guiding principles. And you can see them on, on, the, on the chart here. Uh, the first one being flexible and mod modular. We need to make sure that we're flexible throughout the entire buildup of this. And as you've seen through the last couple of years and, and the, the change of emphasis from, from uh, uh, going directly to Mars, to, to Moon, so forth, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. You see it today uh, with HLS and, and the uh, trying to get to, to 2024 uh, uh, landing as soon as we possibly can. Uh, all these things change the architecture. So to be flexible is, is I think, a real key to this, and, and that's one of the places we really set out to, to do. Uh, also be flexible in the launches. Um, you know, there is a, uh, obviously SLS is a, an important piece of this and, and getting uh, both uh, SLS, it, it is the only human, human rated uh, deep space launch vehicle uh, that exists. So it is absolutely important to, to getting humans to, to the moon uh, and, uh, and getting Orion out. But there's other ways to potentially get some of the infrastructure out there and, and with all the, um, new technologies and inventions that all these uh, very smart launch vehicle companies are coming up with. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of capability out there. So be flexible to that as well because things are going to change. Uh, the third is building blocks. Um, use a building block approach, meaning every single element is uniquely capable, individually capable. Uh, we didn't want to try to create a system where uh, you needed two elements to be up there in order for it to be functional. We wanted to, to basically incrementally gain um, uh, capability as, as you go along building the gateway. Um, and then the fourth is really could just say begin with the end in mind, right? This is the deep space transport and going to Mars. Uh, we wanted to make sure we kept that in our focus throughout the entire buildup uh, uh, of the gateway. And the last one here is minimize development costs. And, and uh, you know, my colleague set it up here is, is try to use things that we already have. Well, uh, I think we're looking at it in two ways. One is use systems that already exist uh, and, and make sure we leverage those, but also reuse for the gateway, for the deep space transport, so we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, keep inventing one-offs uh, as, as we go forward. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, I'll, I'll say before today, all the speakers have been uh, absolutely fantastic. But the one thing I was disappointed in is nobody put up an eye chart um, until I, I saw a few today. So I had to put up an eye chart here since I, I know everybody can, can read this. Uh, uh, what I'll focus you on is, is what this does. It goes through some of the highlights of our PPE and, and what we call our life, which is a large inflatable fabric environment. Uh, that's what we call our habitat. And you can see it's an inflatable habitat that's uh, basically a three-story building. So it's 27 feet in diameter, 27 feet long. Uh, and and uh, if you have a chance, it's, it's actually being shipped down to, actually just arrived at JSC uh, this past week and is getting set up for, for crew testing down there. Um, but what I'll focus you on on this, on this chart is uh, the bottom set of bullets there where we talk about the habitat supports functions needed for crude gateway missions and beyond. Really what we set out to do is make this so that it would support an 1100 day Mars class mission. Be, have the utility for a moon mission and be able to increase the, the capabilities over time there, but really be able to support 1100 day mission as well. You know, if, uh, if we're trying to get to an 1100 day mission, we've never done that, right? We've never done that in space today with humans. Uh, and and uh, we're talking about 30, 60, 90 day type things at the gateway. Well, you know, one of the, one of the keys to, to using the moon effectively for Mars, in my opinion, is, is making sure we practice practice what we're gonna do down, downstream. And uh, it, you know, you're not gonna, the, the worst thing you can do is start, is practice your 1100 day mission on your 1100 day mission, right? If, if you're a you know, budding basketball star, you don't start with an eight foot hoop and, a, and an earth basketball and say, well now I'm gonna go play uh, Steph Curry, right? It's, it's, it's not what you do. So we need to make sure that we keep, uh, keep that in mind at the moon and make sure that we have a, a platform that is representative of what we're gonna take to Mars. Um, and similar to Peter, you know, we have this thought of a minimal gateway. Uh, what can we do early on in, in the buildup to still have utility, still get to the, to the, to the surface? Um, and, you know, we, we show just a descent here. Again, there's descent and descent when you're talking about uh, human capabilities and, and add a transfer vehicle in there as well, potentially. So we're looking at all those different options and how, how they come up. Um, but again, this goes to, to building up capability early on in the system. Uh, and then, you know, when you, when you do try to go to a Mars type of a mission, you may try to start in baby steps as well. You may not go with humans right away. You may try to do this Pathfinder type of a, type of a mission as well. And so there's utility in doing that at the lunar, uh, at, the, at the gateway as well um, and, and beyond. Uh, so this is my get off the stage chart. So I'll, I'll go through this one uh, quickly so we can get to, to some questions here. Um, so we see this as really being an ecosystem. You know, that, that, that term came up yesterday a bit uh, when talking with STEM. Well, I think it, it applies here as well. Um, really everything we do from LEO and ISS or whatever might be after ISS uh, needs to support whatever we do in, in, at the gateway. And when I mean support, I mean they need to be interconnected in, in ways. They need to be able to, 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 to support the operations from one to the other. Same thing goes for the deep space transport. And you can see here, uh, we, we have a lot of systems and, and, and our vision around this is that we wanna make sure that whatever we build in the gateway is extensible to, uh, to, to a Mars type mission. Yes, you may need more power. Yes, you may need more, uh, you know, more crew quarters or something of that nature. Um, but we're trying to, trying to figure those out at the gateway, which is a quick ride home versus figure those out on the way to Mars. That's all I had. Thank our panel for those wonderful presentations. And I'm going to start off with a few questions, and then we'll open it up for audience questions. Uh, I want to start with Maria. Uh, you showed a couple of concepts, and you did choose to focus on the human aspect. And I know coming out of the discussion that we talked about yesterday from um, our AM6 workshop, um, a lot of the human health issues um, that people are familiar with are things like bone loss and radiation protection. You showed the water walls. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the psychosocial aspect. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see if I could draw you out a little bit more. I noticed a couple of things you had where you had like the, uh, the viewport, uh, the electronic viewport that might give them a chance to look at home, you said. 
And that was one of the things that came out in our AM6 workshop was, this is gonna be the first time, I mean, with the Apollo crews, we were out and back. Um, and they were either sea and earth uh, going and coming. But with this, we're gonna put people out there for maybe 30, 60, 90 days uh, to get ready for Mars. And there will be times when Earth will be very, very far, far, far away. So yeah, could you talk a little bit about that and how you've looked yeah, at that? Yeah, I adore this question. And really, I believe that many people uh, in this group of, uh, yeah, among us uh, are really, uh, how can I say, sensitive about how crucial will be in the chain uh, for the mission success, uh, the human part. Uh, and so I believe that the LOB-G, in fact, besides offering all the flexibility for uh, exploration, for teleoperation of uh, uh, rovers on the lunar surface, in fact, would be the perfect place where people will be trained from a human being point of view uh, to be away from home, uh, to be living in a small group uh, right. uh, dynamics. And so it will be really uh, crucial to understand uh, uh, how to select the proper astronaut for this type of mission, uh, how to offer them, as I mentioned before, uh, a, an environment comfortable enough for them not to be abandoned somehow. And so, yes, LOB-G, for many technical plus reasons, uh, to verify and every technology for deep space, yes, for the radiation, yes, for flexible uh, internal volumes, but especially uh, to, to check the capability for the proper people. I don't want to say the right people. Right. Anybody can be right, but is that, uh, I think that is critical to put the right people together and to have them working effectively in a type of environment that is not the natural one we are used to. Mm -hmm. Already to speak in this type of setting uh, can somehow be difficult for many people. Huh? Right. And so can you imagine far away from home when you will need to perform, to be a performer and to be effective in, in dealing with experiment, with technical checks, with so many different things. Uh, and to continue to respect the other people's uh, needs and wills and feelings. Uh, so to, to really create a sort of family uh, in a world that, uh, for sure, we will be able to adapt. Uh, we, we, we showed our adaptation capabilities continuously, uh, but as you said, perfectly just a few seconds ago, will be important to, to verify this type of things before embarking for... 1,100 uh, days. <laughs> yes, uh, and especially yeah. for a travel that will not offer right. you the, cap the possibility to drive back. In right, place. you can't yeah. just get you in the, just, in the yeah, uh, Orion yeah, yeah. and come home. Around. Right. So yeah, I yeah, see exactly. this as a big plus uh -huh. for being in favor of uh, a, a facility orbiting around the moon. Great. All right, I'm going to change it up a little bit for the uh, for the three gentlemen here. Um, and I used, no, I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> They're all my friends. Um, the, uh, except for my coups charts <laughs> I managed not to get. Um, but the uh, question then, um, Maria's question is very appropriate to how we're going to use this to feed forward to Mars. For you guys, tell me again about the gateway. I mean, it, you showed me the minimalist gateway. We talked a little bit about 24. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there who, as soon as they heard the 2024 date, they assumed that we'd go direct. You know, we'll just do what we did on Apollo because, hey, we did it in the 60s. I mean, obviously we can do it again. Tell me why the gateway is important, even in that 24 construct. What does the gateway facilitate? And maybe even I'm asking, you know, give me that kind of the mission profile that you see um, for a 24 mission with a minimalist gateway. So I don't know who wants to well, go first. I'll, I'll start if you want. Start with the I'll, end and so work I'll, this way. Or I'll give you a, which, yeah. I just said okay. Which way either way. way, go ahead, Peter. So I'll start with a. I guess what you're saying is a notional deployment sequence sure, of what this just might kind sort of. Sort of. How like. does it fit for people who are kind of having this question in okay. their mind? Why do we need this thing? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the nice thing. So by the way, the the nice thing about the gateway right now is that NASA actually has the procurement on the street, and actually they're supposed to award it either 
end of this month or by this summer, depending on which day you hear something, um, for the power propulsion element. So the yeah. first element's in the acquisition process, so it's something that is already going to, if they move forward with the plan as is, it'll be ready in 22. Um, if, if you leverage an existing capability, and, and the one I threw out there was a station element, which by the way, our friends at Talos Alenia built the shells that we mm -hmm. outfitted for station, mm -hmm. and their tooling can do the same shells, the 4.4 meter shells mm -hmm. right now, the tooling can do it in Torino. Yes. So, so you can easily you know, build something, whether it's a derived from something else or whether it's derived from station, you can build something that's a design that's already there and you can probably get that there by 22, 23 as well. Ideally, if it's small enough, the best answer is to launch the PPE and whatever you're launching this HAB node, whatever you want to call it, on a single commercial launch. That's the best answer because then the power propulsion element can tug it out. If I have to fly them on two different launches and I got to build a separate tug for this right. habitat to go out, which adds more time and money. So, and so I, ideally, if I could bring them together and fly them together, that's a good thing. Right, and I'll just add for the people in the audience who might not know it, uh, when Peter says the power and propulsion on what can tug it out, um, the reason it can do that is it, it also has solar electric propulsion. So the other thing that power does is power these electric thrusters that are capable of moving that whole stack out to lunar orbit. Yeah, so yeah. if you don't have that and you have a big element with no power or propulsion system, it, you need to add something to take it there. And so that's, that's the added development. Uh, th then the idea would be, um, you know, you can, you can take a descent element, ascent element, maybe even a, a, a transfer element, whether those are commingled and flown on an SLS or flown as indiv individual pieces on a, on a, you know, a rocket that's available, a Falcon Heavy, a New Glenn, or a Vulcan, you know, maybe you take those out commercially, you rendezvous them at the gateway, which is a great aggregation point. Otherwise, I got all these things flying in space, I gotta aggregate. It's a good aggregation point. And then I bring the crew out. The last thing I do would bring the crew out on an SLS um, block one out there, and they, then they would go down to the surface. About a half day, I think, it, the mission I've been seeing is it's about a half day to go from the NRHO down to the surface, about six days on the surface, a half day back, and then you'd ride you know, the crew back up to, or to Earth. On Orion, so that, that's kind of the sequence that we've been talking about. Um, I probably said everything or something close to well, what you guys. Mike, said, but I'll pass it off to you. Although, well, the, the one thing I'd add to that is um, to those people who think you just go direct. I mean, the elements that we have right now can't do that mission without Gateway. Um, Orion can't get down into can't get down low enough oh. into the lunar orbit and get back to be able to do something like Apollo did. Apollo went down to. 60, 60 nautical miles, I think, yeah, is where, the, is where yeah. its orbit was. Orion doesn't have the, uh, the, uh, the propulsion yeah. capability to actually get down and come back. So using the elements that we have, you need to, to stage higher. So that leads you to go to this, uh, to some sort of a intermediate stage in the middle. Um, as Peter said, again, with, with the aggregation, I mean, it, it basically, um, I guess if you look at it from where uh, HLS was, we're looking at 2028, and then we quick got a quick turn to 24, the flexibility that's inherent in the gateway design allowed itself to be, to be very easily modified to be able to suit that. So I mean, it, it, just the fact that you're able to, in a, space, in a space of a couple weeks, come up with something that utilizes the gateway and still gets the mission done, kind of is uh, descriptive of how, um, how flexible and how powerful that system actually is for enabling exploration missions both, again, to the moon as well as on to Mars. So uh, I, w I would add that as kind of a uh, addendum to, what, uh, to, Peter, to Peter Point. Yeah. So, uh, so to add to that, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, I, I agree with the, with the concept of, uh, or, or the technical challenges, I should say, with, with getting directly there. But the other thing I'll say is sustainability. Um, you know, that's been a big part of this, right? We want to keep, create a sustainable presence at the moon. Why? So we can again practice and go to Mars, right? Uh, we did the Apollo mission, like you said, Joe, right? And, and we haven't gone to Mars. Yeah. Once, <laughs> um, so, once we did it, we stopped. Right, right? And exactly. we haven't done it for 50 years. <laughs> exactly. So we don't want to do that again. Yeah. So there's a, there's a big reason to have mistake. a gateway there in and of itself, right? So that we, we have this, this capability. We learn a lot. Um, you know, I think the other thing is you know, when we talk about practicing things, this is a very different setup than what we do today, right? Uh, with ISS, we command... Um, things from the ground to ISS, where in this case, we're going to be commanding things from this gateway, this orbiting platform, down to the surface, which is a very different scenario. 
uh, and to be able to do that both in, 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 uh, at the moon uh, and then going to Mars is, is an important, Mars. important thing. Great. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the same kind of question about the modular aspect. A lot of you in your presentations referred to the modular architecture, the ability to build up. And I think one of the things we're seeing now and this, this idea that we could switch quickly to a minimalist gateway that then still serves as a node that could be added onto later or an aggregation point, you've said. Um, so you say a little bit about, and, and we also talk about the ability to bring in other partners later on. Can you say a little bit about the architecture? It's obviously an open architecture design and work that you might have done to ensure that there's going to be compatibility because obviously in the past, like when we went to Mir, when we did Apollo Soyuz, you know, all those kinds of things where we're, we're putting two dissimilar things together, we had to adapt a lot of things. So. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? And, and I know you've all done work with your studies with NASA on that. So you want to start? Well, sure, I'll, we'll come I'll this start way. this way. Yeah. We'll go this way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so so uh, to, to try to keep that modularity, you know, NASA's done, done, done some work on this, trying to look at uh, um, interoperability standards is what they call them, so that each element yeah. can work with one another. Um, and, and so so there's been some thought around that already, is, is how are all these things gonna, gonna, gonna come together? And to go fast, you're gonna need all of these companies, everybody up here, including including others that, right. that aren't represented here, to pre present or provide something to the gateway in order to get it done in, in that time frame. So those are gonna be important. But the other thing is, you know, collaboration to start now, right? And I know we've been reaching out, and I'm sure, I, I know, uh, colleagues on the panel here have, have been doing the same thing, working with all the different entities that are involved in this, working with the you know the the ESA teams and the and the NASA teams and the industry teams to to figure out exactly how all of these are going to come together. What are the critical functions across each one? Where where do those functions reside uh, in the architecture so we all agree so that one can build off the next? Right, I have to add. Um, I mean, basically, build using. Uh, we talked about all the interoperability standards and the like, but basically building off of ISS heritage of looking at how did we set this thing up to uh, to bring in the international partners so that they could bring they could send modules, they could send I mean ATV, H, uh, HTV, uh, MPLMs. They were all built. They're not necessarily all built in the United States. There were a lot of them were mm -hmm. built. Uh, Thales is, yeah. is actually they're. they're, they're we have to <laughs> kind of bow down to Tali. They, they, they've been, uh, There's a reason Maria's on this <laughs> exactly, panel. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, so really it is, it, it's a matter of uh, the, all the docking mechanisms, uh, making sure that um, not just the docking mechanisms, but all of the, uh, um, the computer infrastructure is ability, you're able to connect in and you'll be able to just, it's just another node onto the yes, system. And so yes. you build it up like you build a computer network. Um, but, Basically, it all comes down to standards and discussing each other. Where, what's the plan? Where are we going? How do we how do we ensure that everybody is building according to the same plan so that we can uh, he can supply one, she can supply one, maybe I get to supply one. SpaceX, Blue Origin, whoever is uh, whoever is br brought in or uh, made available can easily plug into the system and be able to. Uh, add capability to the overall, uh, the overall architecture. Yeah, you rightly said that we need to start from our background, uh, from the space station experience, but I believe that we have to mm, move uh, beyond. For, yeah, move Learn beyond. some lessons yeah, from things that worked or didn't work. Yeah, because especially to allow the flexibility right. To uh, how can I say to start with uh, a minimum uh, architecture that can be expanded, then we will need to um, reconsider, for example, the, um, at subsystem level, the way we solve the thermal control, the way we uh, provide uh, uh, telecommunication, internet connection. So I think that uh, is, is normal. Eh? We want to uh, really take benefit eh, of the learning process. But then we shall use the up-to-date uh, technological opportunities that... Uh, sure, on-ramp things as yeah. they become available. Yeah. yeah, and obviously we want to have improved ECLS systems to go to Mars and Precisely. some things like that. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just add a couple things. By the way, I was going to add something I forgot on the last comment. The other thing the Gateway does is it provides a calm architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. if you think about it, you're going to have cycles where you're outside Earth mm -hmm. coverage. So mm -hmm. this is going to give you, especially as you go to the South Pole, a calm layer oh, that yeah, gets you, you the, link. the yeah. uplink. So that's yeah. one thing that I forgot okay. to mention. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about station. I was going to go back to station mm -hmm. because I would say station is an example of not 
common standards. In fact, um, as a matter of fact, uh, you, you basically add a Band-Aid, a, a Russian power system into a yeah. U.S. power system to make it work. But, but as part of that, I'll, I'll give you another aspect of it. It's um, I forget the exact term we used. Uh, it's having duplicative systems that are not oh non non, non, non dissimilar redundancy. Dissimilar redundancy. Yeah, that's the word. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and that's something we need to think yeah. about because right. and, and I, to put it in simple terms, there's a Russian potty and there's an American potty, and if they're both down, that's a bad day, right? <laughs> and so you kind of want to have some dissimilar redundancy so that you don't have a single fault tolerant system in your in your capability. That's good. And, and by the way, that's part of where having international participation is good because then the international party may bring that dissimilar re redundancy because they're going to bring in a different box or a different system mm -hmm. that, that can help us with that. So, so that, that was the one thing I'd add to what was kind of set up here. Great. Well, at this point, um, I think I'm running out of my questions, so I'm going to throw it out to the audience and uh, invite questions from the audience. So, yes, sir. Because you know we're having to send astronauts all the way up to the moon to assemble this thing, and we could just do it in low Earth orbit, use the power propulsion unit, with gravity assists to actually just move it up there. And plus, you wouldn't have to use the SLS, or you could use the SLS to just launch a one single. Hello. Oh, ah, there we go. Oh, we, yeah. we could hear you fine, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Kind of in there. Yeah, we could hear you, but I'm not sure the webcast. <laughs> yeah, okay. the audience. Yeah. Uh, or using the SLS, which I believe is 70 tons uh, to, LO, yeah. to uh, low Earth orbit, you could just launch a single mass unit, which would be simplify, be much more simplified. Use the power propulsion unit to once again take that right, as a gravity yeah. assist and to go back to low Earth orbit. Without any need of astronauts flying to the moon, we could use the SLS for other pro for actually use, doing that, missions for astronauts to the moon. So I uh, just, uh, just initial comment is when you said astronauts assembling, there actually is no astronaut assembly on the gateway. It's all autonomously operated in autonomous docking. That's part of the standards. Everybody's got a standard docking system and, and you're gonna, Either Orion will tug something, or the um, commercial launcher will provide a tug as part of their their service with this element it brings up there. But it's all going to be autonomous, so there is no. It's not. And by the way, I started my career on space station when we used to have the yeah. node balls and truss tubes and billions of hours of EVAs where they were up there screwing you know trusses into node balls. It's nothing like that. This is all automated um, docking and such. And and the other part of that is they're they're launched fully outfitted out to the, the location. You're not going to really, unless you bring up some new things up as you, you bring them up with logistics. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, if you're going to tug out from Leo, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking at least a year of tugging it, probably with a PPE, especially a sol solar electric spiral. Yeah, and, yep. longer. And, and you're, you know, you add a lot of risk in the whole activity when you do that as well. Well, I'm figuring one using one launch should be much more efficient, be a lot cheaper, for one thing. But aren't the Orions manned when they're hauling uh, parts up to the, uh, where you want to put LOPG in the lunar orbit? Uh, well, so for the, for the initial block one configuration, there will be no cargo with it, so it's just crew. That would just be when, we, launch, when we get yeah. to a block one B, which has uh, the exploration upper stage on it, then you would fly an Orion with anywhere from 10 to 15 metric tons of payload potentially. And in that case, Orion would serve as a tug mm -hmm. to, you, to take it out there, which, which is, you know, you think about it, that's much more effic uh, efficient than maybe having to build another tug to do it on a commercial launch. That's an option too. So are there astronauts on the Orion when they're yes. using it? Okay, so yeah. there are being astronauts assembling it. Oh, no, they're, 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 no. Not astronauts. there are astronauts <laughs> driving right. it up there to slot right. them together. They're, so they're so, present. Right, and, and to get back to your point earlier, I think you know, if you come back to Peter's uh, run through of what we're talking about, we're talking about one commercial launch gets the PPE and possibly a utilization element uh, out. Mm -hmm. You've got a launch for a lander element, and um, then decent um, element, ascent element, and a and, transit and then, element, then and then the, crew. the crew comes last so, on a single yeah, launch. And three of those are commercial launches anyway. Yeah, so well, we're I'm essentially doing what you're saying. 
I think people have looked at the optimization of whether it's better to do it in Leo, mm -hmm. deep in the Earth's gravity well, or whether it's better to do, you know, maximize what you do with your rocket and get to TLI mm -hmm. and put it out there on the cusp of the gravity well, as Mike was describing, and that optimizes out better. Well, mm -hmm. I'm okay. I'm just figuring we could do it more like Skylab, which was, you know, a single unit. Uh, also. But we didn't raise Skylab to do NRHO. <laughs> yes, but you could with the power propulsion unit. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and there again, you, you take what uh, like Peter said, it'd take maybe a year and a half to almost two years for that size with so, the power levels we've got. So I've, we've waited uh, a lot longer for missions to happen. Yeah, so 2024. <laughs> yeah, but okay, so we, build we just it. have to we just yeah. have to make it fit within that time frame. So. Okay, so anyway, let's... thank you. I appreciate oh, also, your I did have yeah. one other okay, question. I just need to get uh, to these about guys. the Europe, if the European service module is delaying us or, or is not powerful enough to get us to the moon orbit we need, why don't we replace it or make it better? That's the well, last question. Actually, the it, the European service module is plenty powerful enough to get it to where it's designed to go. Uh, and it was never, I mean, it was never designed to go that deep into the, uh, into the right. gravity well. That was one of the, one of the lessons learned from Apollo, it, was that it was actually, it was disadvantageous to go that deep. So right. it was more advantageous to stay out, it gave you a little bit better abort capabilities. There were, there were some other technical reasons for it. But Orion was designed to stay up out of the gravity well a little bit further than, than Apollo was. Let's go over here. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Save Man Space. Uh, uh, are each of you confident that you can have a minimalist uh, architecture uh, on site uh, in uh, lunar orbit ready to support a 2024 uh, landing? And, the, and I ask that because commercial crew is, will have taken about five years more than its original uh, deadline of 2015 before it launches its first uh, crew. Uh, and then, then just briefly a point of uh, curiosity. And that is, um, with the gateway, what sort of launch windows do you have? If you miss it by a few hours, do you have to wait another six days? You know, what, what, what sort of launch windows do you have? Thank you. Launch windows for yeah, launch I don't, Are you saying launch windows for the ascent vehicle coming off the surface? Uh, so, no, well, the, the launch windows yeah, for the yeah, gateway elements? Both, both the surface of the moon and, the, and from Earth. Oh, from Earth, okay. Uh, but All both, right. yeah. so both. Both sides, okay. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> Well, I don't think I can answer the launch window. Um, it, I'd have to go talk to, it's been a long time since I've done launch, but, but you, you'd have to look at um, the windows you've got in terms of when you can get to the NRHO right, orbit right. you want. I'm trying to remember, twice I think it's, I think, yeah, I think it's once, maybe twice, twice a month. Twice, twice a month. I believe twice a month. So it, it's not a huge delay, but mm. it's, I mean, there is, there's, for any launch, there's a window that you have to do to, just to get, make question, sure that the, uh, the trajectory is mm. working the proper manner. Yeah. Uh, from the moon, though, the, the design is, it's, it's any time. Uh, it's about ascent, every six so. days, yeah. six, seven yeah, days. It's about, about one, weekly uh, from the moon. Now, mm -hmm. Your other question, though, about the confidence and having something there, um, I'll, I'll tell you, if, if they stay the course and they'll award a PPE contract this year, I think there's a good likelihood if it's, a, if it's something with a low-risk development, something that's got a lot of heritage in it, I think there's a especially if it's based on commercial or government satellites that are being built today, I think there's a good chance that the PP can be on schedule. Pretty close, 22, 23 probably. Um, and, and if you wanna get the habitat on schedule, you, you gotta move, get it on contract and leverage something you got because if you, if you add development to it, a, a big development curve on it, or wait a year and a half to procure it, you're, you're gonna have a hard time, I think, getting to 24. Yep. To, to add to that a little bit, uh, you know, I think we'd all say technically we can do it, right? And, mm -hmm. and if we were we were to, told today go go forth and 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 uh, and get it done, we could do it. The contractual mechanisms and 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 the speed of getting all of these things awarded and and, and solidified—that's the thing I, I think is the, right. the the tallest pole. That's the driver. Okay. Thank you. All. Thank you. Got another question over here, I think. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike, and a uh, question about the. Uh, uh, halo orbit, uh, probably for Peter or Mike, and uh, uh, I have a weak feeling about how that orbit is um, really a, a better performance than any other orbit that you might use. I understand the gravity well situation, but a halo orbit around L2 uh, supposedly has better communication and uh, more stable, um, yeah, but I don't see uh, any real performance uh, comparison of other orbits that might be considered. 
Um, maybe next year you can bring some diagrams showing the, uh, the halo and orbit, how it's designed. I, I, I had one in my charts. <laughs> yeah, if only we had his charts. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. well, to be honest, the uh, NRHO is really, it is a halo orbit around L2. So think of it more that way. It's, it's just a different, it's, it's a different class of the, uh, of the halo species. Um, it's actually really nice in the fact that it, it's never behind the uh, it's never behind the moon, so there's constant communication. That's that's one of the big benefits. And the other big benefit is um, station keeping is on the order of meters per second per year, as opposed to hundreds of meters per second if you're in in other types of orbits. So it's a really stable orbit uh, as long as you maintain that station keeping uh, for the for the elements that are in place. I mean, I, it, it, are there better ones? Maybe. Um, is this one pretty good? Uh, the, uh, I think one of the things we got to be concerned about is the the enemy of the good or enemy of perfect is right. Good enough. Getting good enough. Is, the, the, the enemy of good, good enough, enough is perfect. perfect. Right. Yeah. Right. I get it screwed up in my head. I just have a very weak feeling that uh, a lot of trade-offs uh, should be done to show other possibilities. We should. Well, uh, well actually, I don't know if he's around today, Poppy? Mike, but you oh, should yeah. talk to Ryan Whitley at one yeah. of the breaks Yesterday. if Ryan's still here. Yeah. Ryan's the guy who's looked at a lot of those well, orbits well, in oh, detail. Okay. And, 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 and he can way, tell you <laughs> there have been a lot of trades. Right. Yeah, there, there have been a lot of trades. The other nice thing about the architecture that's being proposed, though, is. So the baseline's in our HO. We can move the gateway to other orbits as we learn and, right. and discover more. And yeah. maybe there's a more optimum orbit for a certain mission we're gonna go do. Right. And the gateway can use Compromise. the power propulsion element to move into that orbit space. So it's not, it, not the beauty in. of it is it's a flexible architecture still. It gives you that flexibility as you learn. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Oh, another question over here. Thank you. Um, you address structure and pro power propulsion quite thoroughly. Uh, what about complementary systems like life support and avionics? Uh, we found that to be a challenge on Orion and, you know, kind of a long pull in the development cycle. Uh, any significant challenges in those areas that you foresee? <laughs> I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with environmental controls. <laughs> I, always, I, I always tell a little story, and, and, and this is because uh, our space station days. You know, when we first built the first environmental control system, for space station and we did all our ground testing, everything was great, worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. We put it up on station yeah. and realized the lubricant, I think in the, uh, the rotary area, didn't quite work well in microgravity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you do on the ground, you're gonna have to go up and do some there. testing in microgravity. Yeah. And, and that's why we're doing a lot of that right now up on space station. Uh, you know, there, there's a system we're getting ready to bring up that is kind of the next gen ECLIS system that will help us learn more about reliability. I mean, right now we're still doing significant repair and replace on the ECLIS system on station. That is probably the long pole. If we're talking about getting to Mars, yeah. solving ECLIS, and then the next one is probably radiation protection. Okay. Those are probably the two key things that we got to work on to really figure out how to, how to do it. And we're demonstrating systems. On, as a matter of fact, another thing on station, they took up a, uh, like a lead bodysuit like you would wear you know, when you get your x-rays at the dentist's office like a lead suit that you would put on, one for a woman, one for a man, and, and they're Lovely. testing out ergonomically how, that, how you could operate in space wearing something like that if you had to wear some localized protection for radiation. So there's things they're doing that are looking at it. Yeah, we also carry on a lot of experiment on board the space station, including a jacket filled with water that people can wear for radiation protection. As for life support system, uh, we, we, we do a lot of research uh, in, uh, how can I say, uh, involving plants in the loop. Oh, right, uh, yeah. So green. small greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Regenerative type of life support system. Right. Yeah. Anything else, Mike, Nerge, to add to that question? I think we have one more. It looks like Jeff has a question for us. <clears throat> Probably going to be our last question as I look at the timer. Uh, just to follow up on an earlier question about um, the, the mini hab or, or no or utilization module, or whatever we're calling it uh, yeah. at this particular time. Um, I, you know, you talked about getting it on contract soon. Um, sort of how soon does it need to be on contract? And is there a preferred contracting method in terms of a standard contract or some sort of public-private partnership or some other alternative approach um, to uh, getting it contracted? I think I think I made the I, I made, <laughs> so I think I made the comment. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll start and, and yeah. you know I, I'll tell you um, typical developments about three years four if you want some margin 
So if you're talking about 24 and you want to get this up in 23, that puts you in probably about a, a year window here of opportunity. Um, and, and by the way, that timeline gets a little bit less aggressive depending on how much common systems, common tooling, current capability. I mean, if you have the machining capability now, it takes a lot of risk out of that. If you have designs that you can base it on, it takes a lot of risk out of that. And, and so, which you, may mean compromises. Right. I mean, that yeah. may drive uh, you know some of the desirements that people out there are wanting to do new things have to give up on to uh, be able to how do it. Exquisite faster. is a system or exquisiteness. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Well, that, and that, and as as you're dealing with things that are more known and understood, that might give more flexibility in the contracting approach too. If it's high risk, high technology things, you're going to be tra traditional cost plus government contracting. If, as, you, if, as you get to something just like commercial crew and commercial cargo is a good example. We've been taking crews to Leo for 50 years, roughly, off and on. And, and so we've got a lot of heritage, heritage and legacy there that allows us to transition it to something different. So, you know, I, I, think, I think it depends really on the solution NASA goes forward with that really will dictate the acquisition approach. The only, the only thing different I would say is that it, rather than given that window, I would say you're probably, rather than a year, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> yesterday would have been good. Yeah, it would be good. Um, the, the sooner we can get it on contract and get, uh, get moving out is going to be uh, uh, more advantageous for 24. Yeah, I have to agree with Mike. I mean, uh, I think we were all looking for a, an award earlier this year, and it's, it's, it's pushed out a... Uh, out a bit and and you know there's some transfer time and other things that that come into play with getting getting the PPE out there uh, in in 2023 so uh, the sooner we can we can get on contract uh, the, the better all right well at that I think we're gonna call it a wrap and I'd like to thank our panelists one more time